It all comes down to matching the, the message we're trying to convey, the outcome we're trying to achieve, and then the format and best way to deliver that message to the audience that we're trying to help. So don't get lost in one piece of the puzzle or another. Make sure we're considering all of these different factors so that when we build a piece of content, we produce a really insightful, engaging video. We make sure that it is going to try to solve the right problem for the right audience at the right time and place. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are and wherever you're watching from. I'm Matt Pierce, host of The Visual Lounge, where we talk about using images and video in the workplace. Today, we're gonna to be talking about using video, particularly for a specific audience that I think is one that it might be hard to get video to. We're gonna find out if that's true. I think it might be something that people that you interact with on a regular basis are frontline workers. So we're gonna talk about this topic, using video with JD Dillon. So let's go ahead and introduce JD. So J.D. Dillon is a veteran talent development leader, former Disney cast member, and dedicated back to the future aficionado. He became a learning and performance expert over two decades, working in operations and talent management with dynamic organizations, including the Walt Disney Company, Kaplan, and AMC Entertainment. A respected international speaker and author of the new book, The Modern Learning Ecosystem, J.D. continues to apply his passion for helping people to do their best work every day as Exonify's chief learning architect and founder, Learn Geek. He specializes in modern learning practices, including microlearning, knowledge sharing, ecosystem strategy, and AI powered solutions. He's also never ridden a bicycle. With that said, please help me welcome JD Dillon to the Visual Lounge. Hey, JD. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. There's there's a lot to unpack just in, in that bio, uh, particularly at the end, but maybe we'll save that for later. Uh, I want to jump in with our, our first three questions that we ask everybody. So I'm curious, you've, you've obviously worked for a lot of organizations that uh, a lot of them have an entertainment kind of aspect to them, you know, with, with Disney and AMC Entertainment. Um, I'm curious, how did you get involved with using images and video in your, your workplaces? I think it began with storytelling. So if you were to ask me what was the first instructional video or media that I ever developed, it was um, associated to the, the cartoon Kim Possible. Mm. And they opened an attraction at Disney, specifically at the theme park Epcot uh, around Kim Possible. And they wanted guest service training specific to the opening team at Kim Possible. And it was going to be an instructor led event. So uh, we didn't do a lot of e-learning or digital content at that time. And I was trying to think of a way that I can engage the frontline team who's going to be working at this attraction. It's a, it's a 10 year group of people, people who are recruited in to open this new experience. And it was going to be a different type of an experience. So instead of a ride that you sit and kind of passively engage with, it was going to be an active experience where you pick up uh, at the time it was a flip phone and you wander throughout a, a pavilion in the world showcase at Epcot and you go and complete these different missions using your phone and have interactions with different parts of the landscape and props and, and different things. So it was a very different type of interactive attraction. So they wanted a very engaging kind of interactive training experience when it came to how would these cast members work with the guests to send them on these missions that were you know, special agent themed around Kim Possible. And I decided, well, what better way to teach them how to send people on a Kim Possible adventure than to put them through a Kim Possible adventure. So I got a peer of mine who came out of the entertainment side of the business, got some costumes. We went to Epcot early one morning <laughs> and I had a camera and we just kind of went through the paces of shooting these different video encounters in different countries. And that's one of the cool things about working at Disney is I need to shoot a, I need to shoot film at Mexico. Well, I have Mexico. So I can, I can have a, all of these different set pieces that I can work with. So, and the, the concept of the class became that the, the people in the room had to use their guest service skills to defeat a, a brand new Kim Possible villain who was wreaking havoc on the guests at Epcot. By havoc, I mean stealing strollers and dumping trash on the ground, you know, yes. the types of things that you can do at Disney. And as people work through the class, different videos would pop up uh, embedded in the PowerPoint presentation of the villain doing these different types of things. And actually the kind of my calling card in my early days of instructional design and content development was the opening slide of Kim Possible because I, I scripted the class so that the instructor of the class would start out by being really dry 
This is a very traditional class, a very traditional opening slide. And then the first click unleashed a media-laden PowerPoint moment where there was an alarm sound that went off and then the slide started to tear itself apart <laughs> using PowerPoint animations. And then a video screen dropped in the place and then a video popped on and it was a message from headquarters where we need to recruit you to help Kim Possible defeat a new villain, which is again, very much borrowed from every theme park attraction, right? Cause you're always just there to see something and then something goes wrong and they need <laughs> you to help them out. So I borrowed from our own, you know, kind of attraction engagement design and then used videos embedded throughout the instructor led training uh, to engage people in this world while they were still in a classroom completing what were relatively standard activities and, and whatnot from a training perspective, but with that kind of media design wrapped around it to create a more engaging experience. So yeah, that's, that's where I started with video and training. Well, that's, I mean, wow. What a first entry into the world of video and using it for learning and development. That's, that's pretty fantastic. And I'm, I, and I'm sure not all of the learning you've done since then gets to be that fun either. Right. It's that's a pretty unique, uh, circumstance get, get that kind of character, that kind of space. I mean, I can't just go and say, Hey, this is Mexico. I've got a I've got a white wall and maybe a green screen if I really, really want it. But uh, so I guess second question for you is as you've gone through your career, you're you've, you've done a lot. You've been very successful. Um, you're well known and well regarded in the industry for you, though, as you work with organizations, you help them. How do you start to define success? When is video a success in your from your purview as kind of a learning leader? I don't look at it any differently than I look at any other solutions. So for me, it always comes down to what's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the, the measurable outcome we're trying to achieve? And then work our way backwards from understanding what are we helping the organization accomplish? Who do we need to help uh, accomplish that outcome? What do we need them to do on the job? What do we need them to know in order to execute those behaviors in their everyday work? And then what's the best way for me to help them improve their knowledge, change their behavior, to get to the ultimate outcome. So for me, it doesn't really matter if that ends up being a video-based solution, if it ends up being a job aid, if it ends up being a set of reinforcement questions. I think the measurement story is all similar, but all of that has to be designed and the solution has to be selected based on that information, but especially the context of the people who we're trying to help and how they're trying to solve a particular problem. Because People who do the type of work that we do, we sit in front of a computer all day and we have access to different types of content and technology. It's a very different story than people who work in a theme park or a retail store or a distribution center. So for me, it comes down to making sure we understand the context in which we're trying to help people solve a problem, learn a new skill, whatnot, so that we're making the right decision when it comes to the solution that we're going to apply, but then measuring the impact of that solution is a pretty consistent process to make sure it actually worked and got us to the desired outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, and I love that, right? It's, it's looking at outcome over kind of the medium decision, which I think, you know, I'll be honest, it's really easy for me in a company that works with a lot of media, with a lot of images, a lot of video to say like, oh, it's just make a video, but that's not always the case, right? You want mm -hmm. what's going to get you the right outcome in the right place. Uh, so last question before we get to this kind of deeper topic of more about the kind of the working with frontline workers and those who aren't at necessarily at a computer, give us one tip. What's one tip you would give anyone listening to the show uh, that helped them make a better video for learning outcomes? The communicator matters potentially as much as the message. So I like to emphasize that right now because there's a ton of conversation around AI generated content, mm -hmm. including AI generated video. And one of the things I learned specifically when I worked in contact centers was that there is a meaningful difference between, or is, there can, can be a meaningful difference between how people receive and their willingness to receive a message based on who is delivering the message. So if you, if you were to take a video that is really well produced by the learning and development team, it's an important message that the audience needs to know. And the message is being delivered by the learning and development team in the way that we dis we build the content. In many cases, that might not be as effective as the same message being delivered in a potentially lesser quality video 
but being delivered by someone that has the respect of the audience and they're therefore more willing to lean in towards and listen because they they know this person understands what they're talking about. Maybe they're able to communicate it in a way that better matches the reality and the experience of the audience. So I did a lot of work where I would bring people in who were experts at doing the job, not the subject matter expert, mm -hmm. the people who had street cred, who, you know, the people I was trying to help, they wanted to be like this person. They, they knew that this person solved problems that they experienced every day. And I would put them on camera and ask them how they do different things. Now I could have built an e-learning or I could have shot a video myself explaining some of these concepts, but putting that person on camera to communicate that information in a very simple, straightforward way, I found to be consistently impactful. So making sure that it's not just about production value and the content itself and the format, it's also about who the deliverer of the message is. And I think we have to be careful with regards to how people will receive messages from different senders, even if the message is the same. And I just did a, a session about AI at a conference and I made this ridiculous example where I put a video on screen that was AI generated and it was Santa Claus. It was, it was British Santa Claus talking about the importance of gamification. And I said, do you trust Santa Claus is a sentence I said out loud. <laughs> and then my point was that I then showed a second video and it was Carl Kopp saying the mm. exact same thing. Cause I had lifted the transcript from a Carl Kopp video and then generated Santa Claus saying the same things. And I said, it's the same message, but we have to be careful about how people will perceive the sender. By no means should you use AI Santa Claus to deliver important information. Uh, but I thought it was an interesting kind of extreme example of what I think we're about to see when it comes to uh, how some of these tools can work. Yeah, I, well, I, I really appreciate that because I know I've had a lot of conversations around AI and video. We just had Josh Cavalier on the show not too long ago. And, you know, this this idea that kind of the human connection is still going to be super important. And, and it always has been, And I think, to your point, right? It's been, so I like that. The sender is what really matters. So, so JD, as you've been, you've worked in a lot of these roles that have had this connection with these frontline employees. You know, you've, you, you mentioned cast members at Disney, call centers. Um, particularly if we were to kind of high level, what are some of the challenges kind of out of the gate that those workers face with kind of receiving training in particular, maybe even with receiving like video, because it does seem like there's probably some barriers to entry for those folks versus me, who I am literally at a computer, you know, all my work day and then some more. Absolutely. So even when you kind of break apart and define what a frontline employee is, I generally say that they're people who work directly with your customers and products as part of their day-to-day -day work. And in a lot of cases, they're also the workforce that has to physically go to a place to do their jobs. Not all the time, but in, in a lot of cases. So if you break that audience in, in, in two, there's kind of the deskless workforce, which would include people who work in retail stores and manufacturing facilities, delivery drivers, the people who lit just literally do not work at a desk. Mm -hmm. And then there's a desk side of the workforce, which a contact center agent would be an example of someone who does is on the front line, but does sit in front of a computer every day. So if you consider the difference, just using the example, someone who works in a grocery store and someone who works in a contact center, they have often two wildly different experiences in terms of how they do their jobs, where their jobs are done, and especially what technology they use on the job. So a person who works in the grocery store may use a point of sale system if they're a cashier, they may use the scales behind the deli. They may have a handheld device because they're uh, scanning e-commerce orders, you know, online orders for pickup, those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're probably carrying the most powerful computer in the store in their pocket uh, when it comes to their personal smartphone, right? So there's that. And then the, the, con the contact center workers sitting just like I am in front of a computer every day. So we have to consider what the access point looks like and how that relates to the workflow before we get to the point where we can consider what's a right fit solution or right format to try to deliver a message, whether it's a communication message, whether it's a training message, whether it's a performance support tool uh, of any kind. So you have to consider what's the access point? Um, where do those access points show up in the course of people's day-to-day -day work? Is a personal device an option? Because in some organizations, it's readily accepted, especially after the past couple of years, there's been a, a surge in kind of bring your own device, choose your own device types of strategies. And there are some environments where that's not okay. 
And some where it's just pure, not permitted. Like if you're in a manufacturing facility and you're on the line, you're not allowed to bring your phone <laughs> out there because it's just dangerous to do that. So we have to consider the context and those access points and then figure out, well, when are people potentially going to pull information, right? Are they going to be using it as a performance support tool on the job? Uh, are there a couple of minutes people have in their day where we can push some training to them, um, you know, based on things that they're working on or maybe struggling with? Uh, and then how are we going to reach them with the right format? And I, what has been interesting in the work, especially that I do with Exonify, is we've seen all variations of that kind of access point story, inclusive of internet bandwidth and connectivity, mm. right? So in, in most environments, you know, bandwidth is limited because a lot of it is taken up by operating systems. So the point of sale system is going to win that conversation. So a lot of cases you might see e-learning buffering for extended periods of time. And, and obviously no one has the patience for that given people's media experience that they have every day. So we have to consider, well, how can we make sure that person in that retail store, the person in the grocery store, uh, the, the delivery driver in a truck that's not moving parked, mm -hmm. um, or a person, you know, that's on the back of a moped giving a shared ride in Thailand who does, who has pretty weak cell signal in that regard. How do we make sure they all get the right experience and that we can enable the organization to take advantage of the right media format and not just say, well, the connectivity is not great. Uh, we won't use video. We'll just use documents. Well, what if that's not the best solution for the problem we're trying to solve? So we've, we've embarked on a variety of different kind of technology stories to enable that. One of my favorite is the concept of adaptive streaming, right? So building into the technology that it'll automatically downsample the content mm -hmm. based on the internet connectivity available to that particular employee so that we don't have to worry about, you know, kind of lowest common denominator -ing. that's not a word, uh, the, in, the entire kind of audience, just because certain populations may not have the greatest access, we can kind of bring everyone up a level, make sure the experience is equitable by building technology that enables this type of rich media. Um, and getting that into people's hands, whether it's in their, their personal device or on a scanning device that they use in the warehouse or, or what have you. So it's a really interesting kind of game of chess on the front line to figure out, you know, when can I help people? Where do I help people? What device can people use to get access to support? And then how do we then push the right type of content through those channels to get to those people at the right time? So I've, I've got to imagine if someone's going through this, these thought kind of exercise questions, right? Of like, okay, where, when, why, how, uh, that at some level, if I'm a content creator, maybe if I'm a instructional designer or, you know, I'm working with my HR group, whatever it might be, you're making content for these, these folks that some of those conversations, it's like you, there needs to be up conversations up the kind of the chain for people to have buy-in, but there also needs to be the down the chain because I, I can imagine that someone down kind of working on the front line is going to have an opinion or thought about mm -hmm. that, that delivery, but also up, up, whether it's it, you know, giving me that finding the adaptive streaming technology so I can, you know, get the right platform in place to deliver that video at kind of a, an equitable kind of an experience. But so when you're thinking about those things, how do you navigate some of that stuff? Because it feels like this is at this point, it's the technology, the, the video, the video has to be good, right? The content has to be good. It has to be something that someone can learn from, but like, it doesn't matter how good that is unless these things happen both up and down the kind of the organizational ladder. Does that seem fair? Yeah. The content doesn't matter if it doesn't reach the audience. Right. And it also doesn't matter if it doesn't help deliver the change or enable the change and enable the value that the organization is looking to achieve. And I, I often say, this isn't me. I don't mean to be negative when I say it, yeah. but I often say that no one in the organization cares about learning as much as we do, right? Because we do this for a living. We're having a, we're having a conversation on a <laughs> podcast about learning and development, right? Most people that we work with and support not having this conversation. In fact, a lot of the people we work with still think that learning looks like school mm -hmm. and expect course driven solutions or things that look and feel familiar to the experiences they've had in the past. And we know that's not how learning works. We know that's not how the science of learning works. And then especially when you take into account the nature of frontline work where people are often paid hourly, you know, they're often only scheduling as many people as they need to do the job. And people don't have the autonomy to say, you know what, I'm going to step away. I'm going to, I'm going to go do 45 minutes of training right now. 
No, because that's going to put a giant hole in the operation. You're going to be waiting longer to get your meat at the deli counter because someone made a decision that they don't want to be there right now. It's just not the way that this type of job functions. So that's why we have to, when we're looking at influencing the organization to think differently about learning inclusive of all formats, but kind of going beyond the idea that everything has to be a course or everything has to involve putting people in a room and that sometimes a two and a half minute video can solve a problem if we really narrow down what is the problem we're trying to solve and what's the best way to convey that information to the audience and is a video the right way to do it. So for me, it's always putting this conversation into the language of and the accountability of and the value proposition of the people we're trying to influence. So it's not about learning strategy to your compliance team or your executive team or even your frontline workforce. Right? It's about solving problems that they care about, that they're motivated by and they're held accountable to and showing how this strategy can help compliance maintain compliance. Executive team deliver shareholder value and business results. Frontline employees have the knowledge and skill they need to make sure they can do their job confidently, not get yelled at by a customer because they're able to solve that problem, mm -hmm. You know, gain greater autonomy and greater confidence in the work that they're doing every day. So it all comes down to our ability to, to influence strategically across the organization. And then, as I said from the beginning, is matching up what's the problem we're trying to solve, who we're trying to help, how they do their job to the solution or the format or the content that we're gonna, then going to push through the right channel to get there when they need it. No, I th and I think this this is such an important conversation to have. And I and I know I've heard you talk about these some of these things before that learning doesn't look like it what it did, you know, like what our experience. Most of us we most of us went through school, and it doesn't look like that anymore. So I'm I'm really grateful that you're bringing this up. Uh, I do want to I do want to make some kind of have a conversation, kind of uh, maybe it's a little bit hypothetical, but like let's say we're in our organization, there is that buy in that we can do some of those things to have this equitable type experience. We but we've got a frontline workforce. We think video may be a good solution. And, and I'd love to hear from you, your perspective on, like you just mentioned one thing that I think is, is interesting to the two and a half minute video could be the right solution. Uh, I think we see a lot of prescriptive things about video, in, particularly in the learning space, right? It's gotta be this, it's gotta be that, it's that. I'm curious from your perspective, especially with that lens on the, the frontline folks who are, you know, even if you're desk bound, you're probably you're, that computer time is you're doing something that's like very prescriptive, right? Like, uh, cause I'm in a chat, I'm answering calls, I'm inputting data, doing whatever. I'm curious if you've come across anything about video that you think is, would be helpful to the audience to say like, yeah, here's things to consider as you are starting to put those pieces together and that when video works for that, that particular type of audience versus, you know, if I'm making videos for my company, a lot of software engineers, a lot of kind of that autonomy you talked about, it's going to be very different. There are a few things more frustrating than when you go looking for the answer to a question <laughs> and you run into a video, right? <laughs> because you just want to know what's the key command for this, right? And it's buried in a demonstration that I now have to skip through to find the steps when all I really wanted was a text job, aid with maybe a picture that would yep. show me how to do this. So that it's the same for us when we're designing any type of support material for the audience that we work with is understanding what's the problem they're trying to solve for, in what context do they experience that problem, and what's the best solution to this, and not prescribe a format because it's what we like to do. <laughs> or right, it's got to be something that they're going to be capable of using in the moment that it's necessary. And I think video has a lot of unique value to it in for a variety of different purposes. And that's why I like to wrap kind of communication and training together in this story, because, you know, putting someone on screen to convey an important message in video may be able to trigger a level of motivation, a level of emotional connection that you can't get through an, an alternative format. It might allow a subject matter expert or an authority figure or someone who just people respect to be able to convey not just information, but sentiment and kind of passion around that information that'll help you accomplish what you're looking for. Uh, another example from Disney is I delivered uh, a course on guest service standards at Disney to tens of thousands of frontline cast members during a, a big project. And we used video throughout that, again, instructor-led training 
But the purpose of the video was not to convey the information about guest service standards and how to do the job. I did that as the instructor in the room in interactive you know, conversations and activities with uh, the participants. The videos were there to show people doing it in real life to, again, mm -hmm. to create that connection to what, what we're talking about in the room looks like in, in the real world and to add a sense of engagement and humor in a lot of ways to that story. I can still remember there was a video montage of kind of cast members doing these great things in their jobs. And one of segment of the video had a slow motion clip of a little boy on a bus doing this like dance where he was shaking his hips. And I could, <laughs> I could tell you exactly when people were going to laugh in that video. So what did that do? It, it, it just elevated the mood mm -hmm. and it got people engaged. Even people maybe weren't really excited to be in that room at that time. Example, if you're, if you're a tipped server at Walt Disney World, you make a, a decent amount of money in tips every day. And if you're in a two hour training class, guess what you're not getting? I am not tipping you during those two hours. <laughs> so it, it was in, it, amazing to see how people would connect to those moments of real life right, of, of seeing what the world looks like through a different lens and maybe, you know, allowing you to get outside of yourself because in a lot of cases you can get overloaded with the challenges that you see every day, or, you know, the problems you're constantly trying to overcome, your particular experience of work. And I think video has this ability to put a different lens on our experience and kind of see through the eyes of other people what we may not be seeing or hearing when it comes to the experience of our workplace. So I think video has power. We just have to make sure to harness it in the right ways to engage people in the right types of solutions and not burn people out on video because everything's a video and now everything mm -hmm. kind of blurs together um, or misuse the medium where people were like me wishing it was just a, a document and now I have to watch a five minute demonstration in order to get the one thing I needed. Um, or like, like we said around frontline workers, you know, create a, a, a medium or a format or a piece of content that I just can't access easily because the only place to watch a video in my workplace is on a computer in a back room that I never see as part of my job because it's not my work location. So we have to kind of keep all of those things in mind. But, you know, amongst all of the different formats we have, there's, there's a tremendous power in video and tremendous familiarity in video, right? I got into a lot of video work in my contact center job because I was just trying to be YouTube. <laughs> in a lot of ways, right? I was trying to re not necessarily replicate the content of YouTube, but the experience that people have with accessing information and finding help through the video format. Um, but taking into account how people behave and what their expectations are of video, because that's the other thing. Um, I don't think at this point, everyone is by any means expecting highly produced yeah. content, right? But I think people overestimate when they say, oh, you have a phone, anyone can create video. <laughs> Like, yeah, anyone can shoot video if you're carrying a phone, but creating an engaging piece of content is hard. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like podcasting, right? Anyone can have a podcast, but having an engaging conversation while wearing hoodies like we are doing right now <laughs> is a challenge. So, so making sure we don't underestimate the effort required uh, at the same time, you know, leverage the, the tools and the talent around you. I, I, one of the most talented people I had in video in that contact center job was one of the contact center agents. It wasn't my people, it wasn't me. That person just happened to have a hobby and they were really good in production. So leveraging that skill set helped me elevate what we were doing, but deliver you know the content in a way that felt authentic. Because sometimes just putting someone on camera with a phone can feel more authentic than a full production with lighting and graphics. And sometimes going overboard on the production just makes it feel too glossy. Yeah as opposed to real and helpful and practical. So lots of things there, but I think it's it's making sure we're considering all of those elements of the story, not just jumping to, well, people like YouTube, video's good. <laughs> For what, right? For right. who, when, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, there's a lot there to unpack, but one one of the things I thought about with your, your Disney experience as well, I thought, you know, I gotta imagine the modeling that happens in those videos is is so powerful, right? Because you could you could show the, good examples you could show bad examples you could but otherwise the the time it takes to show those in in environment probably takes a long time so i'm i'm just thinking about that but also like i like what you said about the you know using the people around you it does feel more authentic because you're right literally anyone can turn on a camera and record i i have a premise out there that i've i, I don't know that i'll ever use but it's like any kid with a camera right any kid with a camera could shoot a video 
Mm-hmm. And, and my kids have. My kids have definitely shot videos. But does that make it a good video? Does it make it <laughs> an instructive video? Does it make it an, an, an entertainment video? Like, it's really fun to go back and watch them because it's like, oh my gosh, this is so bad. It's delightful. Mm-hmm. But that's not what we're expecting in the workplace. So I, I, so I appreciate all the, those thoughts and um, kind of where, what, where you took us through that, that journey. Uh, one more question before we get to speed round. I, I, I want to talk about your book for a second. Now, I'm going to be honest, J.D., I have not yet read your book, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. The Modern Learning Ecosystem, right? So give us the pitch. What's the book about? Why should someone check this out? Because I've known you for a while. I, I know you create great content. I've heard good things about the book. Why should someone check it out? Well, one, it's the most obnoxious book cover in the history of the written word. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, the summary would be it's, it's about shifting from programs to systems. It's about taking the concept of learning in the workplace from something that always kind of has a predictable start and end point, which learning does not, right? Mm-hmm. Even if you're done the program, you're not done learning. You're not necessarily going to retain what you learned. You didn't necessarily learn anything. You just finished whatever you were required to do. So going from a world where we as learning and development rely on a programmatic approach to learning to inserting those types of programs and different types of content and courses into a continuous system of work is I'm referring to learning and development a lot now as an always on system mm-hmm. of, of support. So that again, I, I as the employee can reach out and get the help that I need when and where I need it to solve the problem, regardless of what the problem may be. So the problem may just be the customer has a question. I don't know the answer. I need that information quickly. How do I get to that in a reliable, uh, consistent, simple way? Or the challenge may be that I want to become the next manager of the store. How do I put myself on that path? What types of experiences, what types of content, what types of resources are out there to help me develop the knowledge and skill I need so that when the opportunity arises, I am ready to go. So there's all types of variations and complexities of problems when it comes to learning and performance at work. And the idea is that instead of making learning something that is often seen as a disruption to the experience of work, it's something that fits alongside and within the nature of work. Because one of the one of the buzziest terms we like to use in learning and development is learning in the flow of work. All right. <laughs> and I think that f- concept falls short because it's often interpreted as make learning and development resources more easy to access in the course of doing the job. Well, just because I can get to something, just because something is shorter, just because something is more targeted, doesn't mean I'm going to do it. I have the time to do it. I'm prioritized to put my effort and time into that activity. So for me, it's going beyond learning in the flow of work to learning being part of the job. So what the book tries to do is is help speak to how we can re-architect the pieces and parts that we already use today in a way that helps us embed the experience of learning and support into the job for employees, regardless of where you work, the types of audiences uh, that you support. And that's ultimately how I define kind of architecting that modern learning ecosystem is transforming learning from programs into an always on system of learning and support. All right. I mean, I, I love it. I love the idea of thinking about systems. I actually came up through a graduate program that talked, that's what it was. It's systems was in the name. I think we've, I don't see a lot of that system thinking. Uh, and so I love where you're, you're headed with that. Can't wait to check it out. And I encourage everyone who's listening, go get the book. I'm, it's available on Amazon. It's available kind of anywhere learning and development books are found, right? It has um, the most obnoxious book cover and the most obnoxious URL in <laughs> learning and development books, I believe, because the, if you want to learn more about the book, visit jdwroteabook.com. <laughs> so uh, the modernlearningecosystem.com was already taken, so I decided to go another way. Uh, and amazingly, jdwroteabook.com, pretty cheap URL. You know, it's even cheaper, Matt, than that mm-hmm. URL. JD wrote another book.com is even cheaper. (laughs) I already own it. Uh, Nothing there right now. But if someone gives me permission to go again, uh, I've got the website. All right. Well, we'll, 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 we'll be waiting for the second book. We'll get through the first book and then we'll just wait for the sequel. So, well, JD, thank you uh, so much for entertaining me with all these questions I've asked and all the great information. We're going to jump into our speed round. If you're new to the podcast, speed round is meant to be uh, an- quick questions with quick answers. So let's dive right in. Okay. So let's go to our dice cam because, you know, 
got a dice cam. We're gonna roll a 12-sided die. It's gonna determine which questions we're gonna ask JD today. So here we go. First question is up, and that is, uh, uh, yeah, that's a six. I gotta look at the dot where, the, where it is. So number six, JD, is uh, if you could be a hero, this is perfect for you. If you could be a hero in any story, who would you choose and why? I mean, I'm definitely Marty from Back to the Future. And why? I, because like there's um, <laughs> beyond it being a perfect movie and my favorite movie, because if you could see the wall to my right, it's covered in Back to the Future fan art. If you could see the clothing rack to my left, there's a Marty McFly costume on it. And then if you look in the background right about here, there's a book called What If Shakespeare Wrote Back to the Future? And then if you do pick up my book, there are an inordinate number of Back to the Future references <laughs> in this thing, including on the first page, there's a Back to the Future reference. So I am just, um, that's why my, my professional bio now mentions that I'm a Back to the Future aficionado. So I, if I'm gonna put myself in any story, I am most prepared to portray that role to the point where I know all of his dialogue. So I can just fit right in. All right, so you are you are Marty McFly in those and uh, is, is sequels too. I've got to ask, like, or number just number one or er, the whole series. Uh, let's do part one, the whole thing. Second half of part two, and now uh, part three. Okay, okay. You you, you got to ask because you know yeah. with a trilogy, you just not not all is created equal. So true. All right, all right, JD. Great great answer. Let's go to our next question here. The die is being rolled, and it is. Oh, we're gonna go right to question number seven. So if you had to shift careers out of the world of, you know, learning and development, what you do, what would you do instead? I, I just want to be Bill Hader. So <laughs> everything and anything Bill Hader, because I think he has a fascinating career in terms of his story, how he came to be a comedian, how he came to get on Saturday Night Live, and then how he ends up uh, writing, producing, directing, and starring in Barry, which I just binged watch a couple days ago. So it's very fresh, top of mind. So... Yeah, I'm given the number of costumes that I wear, and I, I <laughs> largely blame my time at Disney for this. Uh, I'm clearly fascinated by performance, and I think it's something that I very much missed out on as a child because I was extremely shy and scared of talking to people, and I wouldn't have been able to do this as a kid, even having this conversation. So now, nowadays, I, I'm fascinated by performance. I'm a huge musical theater fan. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd definitely be on that side of the world. And I think Bill Hader's career is fascinating to me. All right. Well, that's, uh, you know, maybe, who knows? Your, maybe, the future's not written yet. Maybe you could go back to the future and figure connect it and out. Dots. Connect and dots. Connect and dots. All right, last question here. Here we go. Last roll of the die. Spinning, spinning, spinning. And we, wow, I've never had a sequential order seven, like this. Six, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. That is fantastic. So if you had to pick one image, JD, that represents you, could be, uh, again, we'll use image broadly. What would that image be? I mean, it seems like these questions are just, I need to mix them up maybe. They're, I never expect them to be so close, but you get, a, you get one image. I mean, I mean, it's, I, would I necessarily pick this? I don't know, but I think the world has picked it for me and it's this. Thing. <laughs> so, um, for those who are listening, I, it's a bar graph. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is grayscale. <laughs> it is grayscale. It's not a color. I did not have, uh, the resources to print my book in color or do the audiobook, but I would really like to do an audiobook. Um, <laughs> but the, the bar graph is the modern learning ecosystem framework. It is literally a PowerPoint slide that I created, uh, you know, the first version of for the first time I did a presentation at a conference in 2014. And then it just kind of kept coming back throughout the past 10 years in different forms. And then it eventually just became the, what I was, people suggested I should write the book about that. Okay. So I think of any picture or visual on earth, what is directly associated to me most of all, it is those six colorful bars that form the center point of my book. Perfect. Well, I, I like that. I was I was sort of expecting maybe a, another Back to the Future picture reference, but we already got that one out of the way. So, well, JD, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, you know, I'm always uh, just astounded by the wealth of knowledge that you have, the depth that you're able to give, and I appreciate everything you've shared with us today. For those who are wanting to connect with you, they want to learn more beyond just reading the book, where should they 
find you? Sure. I am incredibly Googleable. Mm -hmm. So I, I changed my name for SEO purposes. So if you Google JD Dillon, you'll find me, but I'm not the boot guy. There's a guy who sells boots. There's a guy who's in the energy business and then there's me, but otherwise a couple different places. So if you go to uh, learngeek.co, that's my personal website It includes where you can find my book writing, my talk show, all different types of things are available there. Uh, my schedule of events, if you're interested in hanging out with me even more. Uh, exonify.com is, is where I do my, the work with my team building technology and content to enable frontline workers. So check that out. Tons of resources, a lot of interesting research into the frontline workforce. And otherwise uh, I do a lot of sharing nowadays on LinkedIn, um, because, uh, it's the only real social network that seems to have professional value at this point. So, um, <laughs> connect with me on LinkedIn, happy to have conversations. And I, I, I share different insights, research, you know, things I'm, I'm working on and thinking about. And I also uh, curate job openings in learning and development. So if that's helpful or to anybody, um, I always appreciate when people echo those posts and it's not just me, folks like Karen North are doing that as well, just to try to be helpful if people are out there looking for their next opportunity. So happy to connect uh, on LinkedIn and, and share thoughts and insights there as well. Awesome. And yeah, so definitely go check out JD's stuff. Go amplify, go learn from him. So JD, as we, we start to wrap up our show, we always like to ask our guests, what from this episode, our conversation today, what is your final take? It all comes down to matching the, the message we're trying to convey, the outcome we're trying to achieve, and then the format and best way to deliver that message to the audience that we're trying to help. So don't get lost in one piece of the puzzle or another. Make sure we're considering all of these different factors so that when we build a piece of content, we produce a really insightful, engaging video. We make sure that it is going to try to solve the right problem for the right audience at the right time and place. Well, thanks, JT. And if I was, if I had thought about it, I would have prepared like a Doc Brown impression for you to play off of. But maybe next time we'll we'll do that. I'll get the the wig and you can wear the vest and it'll be a thing. <laughs> 10 points for anyone who noticed that there is a flux capacitor sitting behind me in the background as well. Just <laughs> cool. constant back to the future references. We will award those points appropriately. So JD, thank you so much. And thanks to you for tuning into our episode today. Of course, we're hopeful that you like what you're hearing, that this is valuable to you. And if you're working with those frontline workers that in our, they're in your organization, you're tasked to work with them, we take some stuff JD said to heart. Go get his book, learn more about how you can help work with them to make sure that you're leveling them up and helping them. And of course, we like it when you like, subscribe, do all that good stuff with us too, because it helps our audience find us that, you know, this information about using images and video, we want to sh uh, we want to share the word. We want people to find out how they can get better because our whole thing is we want you to level up every single day. Thanks everybody.